Okay, now some uh, some uh, content, some stuff, uh, some uh, uh, ideas, data, and, uh, and I hope that you'll see that uh, the Richard spirit is very much in the message that I'm going to convey this evening. Let's see if I get this to work. Uh, the topic of my lecture this evening is the history of violence. And believe it or not, and I know most people do not, violence has been in decline for long stretches of time. And today we are probably living in the most peaceful era in our species of existence. The decline of violence has not been steady. It has not brought rates of violence down to zero. And it is not guaranteed to continue. But I hope to persuade you that it is a persistent historical development, visible on scales from millennia to years, from wars and genocides to the treatment of children and animals. I'm going to walk you through six major declines of violence, try to identify their immediate causes, that is, particular historical events of the era, but then try to tie them together in terms of their ultimate causes, namely general historical forces, interacting with a constant human nature. The first decline of violence I call the pacification process. Until around 6,000 years ago, humans everywhere lived in anarchy without a central government. What was life like in this state of nature? Uh, this is a topic that uh, people have held opinions on for uh, literally centuries. In 1651, Thomas Hobbes famously wrote, that uh, in a state of nature, the life of man is solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. A hundred years later, Jean-Jacques Rousseau countered that nothing can be more gentle than man in his primitive state. Now, these gentlemen uh, were pretty much speculating from the armchair. Neither of them had any idea of what life was like in a state of anarchy. But today, we can do better, because there are two sources of evidence on rates of violence in uh, pre-state societies. The first is forensic archaeology. You can think of this as CSI Paleolithic. <laughs> Namely, what proportion of prehistoric skeletons have signs of violent trauma, such as bashed in skulls, decapitations, arrowheads embedded in bones, or mummies found with ropes around their necks? Um, here I've assembled uh, uh, all the estimates that I could find, there are uh, 20 of them. As you can see, they span quite a range, but they average out to uh, about 15%. That is, 15% of prehistoric skeletons show signs of violent trauma. Is that a big number or a small number? Well, we can compare it to some rates for uh, modern states. Uh, the United States and Europe in the 20th century come in at about uh, two-thirds of 1%, including all the deaths from uh, both world wars. World of the, in the 20th century, if you try to uh, aim for the biggest estimate that the numbers would justify, throwing in all of the wars, the genocides, the man-made famines, you can push it up to about 3%. Here's the graph for the world in the 21st century so far. Uh, the bar is invisible. It's less than one pixel high at a rate of about 3 tenths of 1%. The second source of uh, evidence on violence in non-state societies comes from ethnographic vital statistics. The wave of agriculture and uh, settled societies and government that swept over the world from a few cradles of civilization about 6,000 years ago left a few pockets of the world still in a state of anarchy. And anthropologists who spent long periods of time in those societies have tabulated the uh, rates of death from various causes, including uh, violence. I found uh, 27 estimates from the anthropological literature, and once again, they span quite a range, but they average out at about 500, I'm sorry, I plotted them here on uh, the conventional scale for measuring violence of deaths per 100,000 people per year. They span quite a range, but they average out at 524 per 100,000 per year. That is, in non-state societies, Every year, about one half of 1% of the population dies at the hands of their fellow human beings. Again, is that a big number or a small number? Well, let's compare it to those from some uh, modern state societies. 
um, stacking the deck against modernity by cherry-picking some of the most violent countries during their most violent periods. Like uh, Germany in the 20th century, two world wars, which comes in at a rate of 144 per 100,000 per year. Russia in the 20th century, uh, two world wars and a civil war at 127. Japan in the 20th century, a world war that ended with two nuclear strikes, comes in at a rate of 27. United States in the 20th century, two world wars and at least half a dozen other foreign wars, comes in at a rate of less than three. The world of the 20th century, again, uh, aiming for the biggest justifiable estimate, throwing in the world wars, the small wars, the uh, genocides, the man-made famines, you can get the rate up to about 60. And uh, here is the world in the 21st century. Again, the graph is uh, less than a pixel high at three one-hundredths of a war death per 100,000 per year. So not to put too fine a point on it, but when it comes to life in under anarchy, uh, Hobbes was right, Rousseau was wrong. The immediate cause uh, was the rise and expansion of states leading to the various taxes that uh, history students read about, the Pax Romana, Pax Islamica, Pax Hispanica, and so on. Now, it's not that the um, historical kings and empire emperors had a benevolent interest in the welfare of their citizens. Uh, rather, it's that tribal raiding and feuding are a nuisance to the imperial overlords, who would just as soon keep the people alive to supply them with taxes and soldiers and slaves. So just as a farmer has an interest in preventing his cattle from killing each other, that his dispute, their disputes are of no interest to him, and he, uh, he's just a dead loss as far as he's concerned. So the uh, first overlords, as a byproduct, reduced the chances that uh, a person under their control would die at the hands of uh, another person under their control. The second historical decline of violence um, can be appreciated by looking at this woodcut showing a typical day in the life in the Middle Ages. And the process that brought this mayhem under control has been called the civilizing process. Now, uh, it turns out that homicide statistics in many parts of Europe go back literally 800 years. And historical criminal criminologists have plotted them over time. Here we have a number of uh, estimates from England from the year 1200 to the year 2000, plotted on a logarithmic scale from a tenth of a homicide per 100,000 per year to one to 10 to 100. And as you can see, there's been a massive decline in the uh, English homicide rate, such that a contemporary Englishman has about 1 35th the chance of being murdered as his medieval ancestor. This is true not just in England, but in every European country uh, for which data are available. Here we see uh, similar data from Italy, the Netherlands, Germany, and Switzerland, and Scandinavia. Here we have the average of those five regions. Uh, and for the sake of comparison, I've also thought of that 500 per 100,000 per year figure for non-state societies. This gap here is what I've been calling the pacifying process, this further decline, the civilizing process. What were the immediate causes? Well, the term civilizing process comes from a classic book by the German sociologist Norbert Elias, who argued that in the transition from the Middle Ages to modernity, there was a consolidation of central states and kingdoms out of the medieval patchwork of baronies and principalities and duchies. With it, criminal justice was nationalized, and the constant feuding and brigandage and warlording of medieval knights gave way to the king's justice. Also, during this era, there was a growing infrastructure of commerce. Uh, there, the rise of money and contracts that could be recognized within the boundaries of the newly consolidated states, and technological improvements in transportation and timekeeping that made it uh, cheaper and more efficient to trade over territories. As a result, zero-sum plunder began to give, give way to positive-sum trade, an idea that I'll return to at the end of the talk. The third decline of violence can be appreciated by uh, considering some of the ways that the early kingdoms uh, kept law and order within their boundaries, uh, namely uh, sadistic corporal forms of corporal and capital punishment, such as breaking on the wheel, burning at the stake, clawing with iron hooks, sawing in half, and impalement. 
But in a process called the humanitarian revolution, the use of torture as a routine form of uh, criminal punishment was abolished in country after country in a uh, wave of abolitions that were centered in the second half of the 18th century, uh, including our own prohibition of cruel and unusual punishment in the Eighth Amendment to the Constitution, which, as it turns out, occurred pretty much in the middle of this world war, or this at least uh, European-wide wave of abolitions. Also abolished during this period was the profligate use of the death penalty for non-lethal crimes. In 18th century England, there were 222 capital offenses on the books, including poaching, counterfeiting, robbing a rabbit warren, being in the company of gypsies, and, quote, strong evidence of malice in a child 7 to 14 years of age. By 1861, the number of capital crimes had been reduced to four. <clears throat> Likewise, in uh, colonial and early, the uh, colonial America and the early republic, the death penalty was available and exuberantly used for theft, sodomy, bestiality, adultery, witchcraft, concealing birth, slave revolt, and counterfeiting. Uh, indeed, this graph shows the percentage of American executions for crimes other than murder from colonial times to the present. And as you can see, in the colonial times, the majority of executions were for crimes uh, other than murder by uh, the uh, modern era, the only crime punishable by death other than murder was conspiracy to commit murder. Now, of course, the death penalty itself has been abolished in every uh, major democracy except the United States. This graph shows a timeline from 1775 to the present of European countries with capital punishment. Now, most of the abolitions took place in the last, uh, the second half of the 20th century. But the blue line, which shows the number of European countries that actually execute people, shows that the, uh, well before the politicians got around to striking capital punishment from the law books, the, their, uh, the citizens uh, pretty much lost their taste for putting people to death. And on average, about 50 years elapsed between the last actual execution in a European country and the time that the lawmakers got around to striking it from the law books. Now, of course, the United States is the great exception uh, to this movement, or I should say 33 of the 50 states are, because capital punishment has been abolished uh, in the other 17. But even in the United States, capital punishment is a shadow of its former self. Here we have the rate of executions in the United States per capita, and as you can see, there's been a dramatic decline. Nowadays, for all its notoriety, maybe 30 or 40 people are executed every year in a country that has more than 16,000 homicides every year. Also abolished during the humanitarian revolution were witch hunts, religious persecution, dueling, blood sports, debtors' prisons, and most famously of all, slavery. Slavery used to be legal everywhere on earth. No one seemed to think there was anything wrong with it. The, we all know, of course, that the Bible had no problem with it. Uh, So-called democratic Athens was a slaveholding society. But beginning in the second half of the 18th century, there was a trickle of abolitions which eventually encompassed the entire globe, uh, culminating in 1962 when Saudi Arabia and Yemen got around to abolishing slavery. And then in 1980, Mauritania became the last country on earth that had slavery, slavery as a legal government-supported institution. So we are now living, uh, we have been for the last 30 years, in an unprecedented era in world history in which slavery is not legal anywhere on earth. What were the immediate causes of the humanitarian revolution? Well, uh, the, probably the best candidate for an exogenous prior cause might be the rise of printing and literacy. This graph shows that prior to the 18th century, there was a 25-fold increase in the economic efficiency of printing a book. Uh, this graph shows that in the 18th century, that technology was put into practice, and the number of English books published per decade increased exponentially, a kind of early version of Moore's Law. Uh, and for the first time in history, a majority of the population could read those books. It was in the 18th century that the literacy rate climbed about 50% in England. Why should literacy matter? Well, we have another name for the era of the humanitarian revolution. It's called the Enlightenment because this was the era in which knowledge began to replace superstition and ignorance. 
Uh, and it's not implausible that a literate and educated populace is less likely to believe nonsense such as that Jews poison the wells, heretics go to hell, crop failures are caused by witches, children are possessed by the devil which has to be beaten out of them, Africans are brutish and fit only for slavery, and that is bound to undermine many rationales for violence. As Voltaire said during this era, those who can make you believe absurdities can make you commit atrocities. Also, literacy is a technology of cosmopolitanism, the mixing of people and ideas. And again, it's not implausible that the consumption of fiction and drama and history and journalism can get people into the habit of inhabiting other people's minds of seeing what life is like from their point of view, which uh, theoretically could expand their sense of empathy and decrease their taste for cruelty. And that's another idea that I'm going to return to at the end of the talk. The fourth decline of violence has been called the long peace, and it speaks to the frequently uh, reproduced factoid that the 20th century was the most violent in history. Well, it turns out that people who uh, make that claim never cite any data from any century other than the 20th. So this is a, uh, an alleged trend based on one data point. And there are a lot of reasons to think that it is uh, false. It is certainly true that as events go, the Second World War was the worst thing that ever happened in human history. Um, however, it is not so clear that it is the worst thing that ever happened in terms of the percentage of the world's population. Um, here's a graph that uh, plots on a, an event-wise uh, basis the 100 worst things that human beings have ever done to one another. It comes from a book called The Great Big Book of Horrible Things by Matthew White, a man who calls himself an atrocitologist. Uh, I plotted them the uh, scale by the duration, uh, sorry, scaled by the population of the world at the time, not scaled by duration. Uh, on a logarithmic scale from 500 BCE to 2000 CE. And as you can see, history's worst atrocities were pretty evenly sprinkled over 2,500 years of human history. And World War II only comes in at ninth place. World War I doesn't even make the top 10. Well, let's uh, zoom in on the last half century, a uh, half millennium, a period of time in which uh, we've got uh, historical data. I should add, by the way, you can't help but notice in looking at this graph, that the data cloud kind of funnels down as you get to the present. Presumably, this is, does not reflect the uh, possibility that in ancient times they only committed really big atrocities, and more recently, we've also committed medium sized and small sized atrocities. The obvious explanation is the closer you get to the present, the better the historical records, and a lot of the small stuff that took place. Uh, a couple of thousand years ago, there was a tree falling in the forest with no one to, uh, to hear it. But in the last 500 years, since the advent of the printing press and the uh, transatlantic sailing ship, our data become uh, a bit better. If we uh, focus in even further on the last century, uh, we can plot the rate of deaths in wars of all sizes. Uh, and you can see that there are two unmistakable spikes of bloodletting corresponding to the First and Second World Wars, but that rather than being part of an ascending series, the Second World War was something closer to the last gasp, and since then, the uh, curve has been uh, pumping along the floor. Uh, this is the development in history that, uh, to the astonishment of historians and political scientists, has been called the Long Peace. Or I should say, not that it's called it, the astonishment is that it happened. Uh, namely, that since 1946, there has been an unprecedented decline in interstate war, that is, wars with a government on each side. In fact, the most interesting statistic from the last two thirds of the century is zero. Uh, no wars between the United States and the Soviet Union. Uh, contrary to every expert prediction that uh, World War III between them was inevitable. Many of us in this room grew up with those predictions. We all knew it was just a matter of time. We also knew that this war would be a nuclear war. Uh, and uh, contrary to every expert prediction, the last nuclear, nuclear uh, explosion that the world has seen in war was Nagasaki two-thirds of a century ago. 
There have been no wars between any two great powers since the end of the Korean War in 1953, 60 years ago. Uh, no wars between any two Western European countries. And uh, the most interesting thing about that statement is how boring it sounds. We today are likely to say, oh yeah, of course, who would ever think, for example, that you know, France and Germany would fight a war? Inconceivable. But needless to say, through most of human history, this was far from inconceivable. Um, in fact, Western European countries alone started two new wars a year for 600 years. As of 1946, that number fell to zero, and it stayed there. And there have been no wars between developed countries. That is, the 40 or so richest countries on Earth have not fought each other since 1945. Um, what about the rest of the world? Well, in a, a development that I call the new peace, the long peace seems to be spreading to the rest of the world. Now, as I mentioned, the overall historical trend since 1946 has been that there have been fewer wars between countries. Now, there have to be sure been an increase in the number of civil wars. As newly independent states with inept governments fought off insurgent movements, with both sides egged on and uh, financed and armed by the Cold War superpowers. But after the Cold War, the number of civil wars declined too. The question then is, which wars kill more people? The old-fashioned wars of one country against another, or the newfangled wars where you've got a guerrilla movement fighting a government? And uh, here's a graph that gives the answer to that question. For each decade since the 1950s, it shows the uh, rate of death in wars of several different categories. First of all, interstate wars, government against government. Here's the rate of death with, uh, from internationalized civil wars, a civil war where some foreign power butts in on the side of the government. And here's the rate of death in uh, purely internal civil wars. And as you can see, the decline in the death rate from interstate wars has nowhere near been uh, compensated for by the rate of death in civil wars. Civil wars kill fewer people than uh, interstate wars. There's nothing like a pair of rich countries uh, chucking artillery shells at each other, bombing each other's cities, having massive tank battles with thousands of tanks facing each other in the battlefield to kill a lot of people in a hurry. When you've got a bunch of teenagers with Kalashnikovs, they can do a lot of uh, damage locally but the numbers just don't add up the way they do when you apply a government against a government. So where does that leave us in terms of the number of, uh, or the rate of death in uh, uh, war in general? Well, I'm going to show you in a graph that's a stacked layer graph, where the thickness of each layer corresponds to the rate of death of each of four categories of war, and the height of the entire stack shows the rate of death from all wars combined. So first we have the colonial wars, where a, an imperial power tries to hang on to a colony, which tapered off to uh, zero by the 1970s. Here we have the interstate wars, country against country, with spikes for Korea, Vietnam, and Iran, Iraq, by bumping along the floor to a very low level. Uh, here we have the rate of death in uh, civil wars, purely internal civil wars, and internationalized civil wars. And as you can see, the entire trajectory is something of a roller coaster, but with an unmistakable downward spike. So that in the 21st century, we uh, see a thin laminate of layers hugging the floor, showing the unprecedentedly low rate of death in wars of all kinds put together. And this is the graph that appeared in my book, Better Angels of Our Nature. It had data, uh, the most recent data when the book went to press, which were uh, since 19, to, uh, up to 2008. Many people have asked me, well, since the new conflicts following the Arab Spring, have we seen the rate of, of uh, death in war shoot back up again? So this morning, I extended the graph with the most recent data I could find uh, up to the end of the year, the most recent year, 2012. And uh, here you see what the trend has been. So there is definitely an uptick due to the war in Syria. But by the perspective of the entire post-war period, uh, it is still very unlikely that a human being on the planet Earth will lose uh, his or her life to a war. What were the immediate causes of the long peace and the new peace? Well, three hypotheses were tossed out by Immanuel Kant 200 years ago in his book, in his essay, Perpetual Peace. 
he argued that democracy, trade, and an international community would all uh, disincentivize leaders from dragging their countries into stupid wars. More uh, recently, the political scientists Bruce Russick and John O'Neill tested Kant's hypothesis quantitatively in a large sample of militarized disputes and found that Kant got it right three out of three times. All of these factors increased in the second half of the 20th century, and all of them are statistical predictors of peace, holding all other factors constant. Finally, and I guess this is a, a particularly appropriate so slide to show uh, this weekend on the uh, 50th anniversary of the March on Washington, there are the rights revolutions, the targeting of violence on smaller scales directed against vulnerable sectors of the population, like African Americans, women, children, and animals. The civil rights movement, uh, to begin with, put an end to the custom of lynching, which took place at a rate of about 150 a year at the end of the 19th century. That's three lynchings a week. By the 1950s, that rate had been brought down to zero. Uh, Non-lethal hate crimes against blacks have been in decline since uh, the FBI first started reporting them in the 1990s. And uh, this isn't just an American phenomenon, but a worldwide phenomenon. I'm going to show you a graph that shows the number of countries that have laws on their books that discriminate against minorities, various Jim Crow and apartheid laws. Uh, as you can see, they have been in steady decline since 1950. The blue line shows the number of countries with policies that favor their ethnic minorities, various remedial discrimination and affirmative action laws, and more countries have laws that favor their uh, minorities than that discriminate against them. The women's rights movement has brought about an 80% decrease in the rate of rape since its peak in the 1970s. A similarly dramatic, dr dramatic decrease in rates of domestic violence, um, and a uh, sharp decrease in the most extreme form of domestic violence of all, namely uxoricide, the murder of a female romantic partner, and meridicide, the murder of a male romantic partner. In fact, the decline has been even steeper for uh, male victims than for female victims, showing that the women's movement has been very, very good for husbands. <laughs> the children's rights movement has shown uh, has brought about a uh, sharp decrease in the practice of corporal punishment. Uh, the now only a minority of states will allow their schools to paddle or strap their children. Every public opinion poll has shown a decline in the approval of spanking, and rates of child abuse, both physical and sexual, have been in decline since statistics were first kept. Uh, and rates of violence at school, despite the various uh, moral panics about bullying and cyber stalking and so on, if you actually count the number of kids who've been harmed, it's been in decline. Finally, the animal rights movement has, has seen a decline in hunting, an increase in vegetarianism, both in the UK and the US, and a steep decline in the number of motion pictures per year at which animals were harmed. Well, this raises the question, why has violence declined on so many scales of time and magnitude? Well, one possibility is that human nature uh, itself has changed, and somehow our inclinations to violence have literally been bred out of us, uh, a possibility that I consider to be rather unlikely. Uh, for one thing, we still see violence in our children. A, uh, about 40% of two-year-olds kick, bite, uh, or hit. We still take and uh, uh, rough and tumble play and play fighting is one of the most robust sex differences across human societies in little boys. Uh, grown up boys and uh, some grown up girls take enormous enjoyment in vicarious violence such as murder mysteries, Greek tragedies, Shakespearean dramas, video games, and hockey. Not to mention movie starring a certain ex-governor of California. And then there are homicidal fantasies. If you ask people, have you ever uh, imagined, fantasized about killing someone you don't like? The results are that about 15% of women and a third of men frequently think about killing people. And about 60% uh, of women and three quarters of men, at least occasionally, 
What does this say about human nature? It says that about 25% of men are liars. <laughs> A uh, more likely possibility is that human nature is and always has been extraordinarily complex and has always comprised both inclinations toward violence and inclinations that counteract them. That means that those 75% of men who confess to uh, homicidal fantasies never come close to carrying them out. Uh, what Abraham Lincoln called the better angels of our nature. And that is what has changed is historical circumstances increasingly favor our peaceful inclinations. Uh, well, what are the motives for violence? I don't think there is one thing called the uh, aggression in, uh, instinct in uh, humans. I think there are a number of distinct factors. There's raw exploitation. The use of violence as a means to an end, namely you uh, eliminate uh, or compromise some living thing that just happens to be an obstacle on the path towards something you want, resulting in rape, plunder, conquest, and the elimination of rivals. There's dominance, the urge of individuals to climb the pecking order and become alpha male, and the corresponding urge in group against group competition for ethnic, racial, national, or religious supremacy. There's revenge or moralistic violence, the idea that it is not only permissible but obligatory to harm someone as payback for some uh, sin resulting in vendettas, rough justice, and cruel punishments. And then there are you. Utopian ideologies, uh, belief systems like militant religions, nationalism, Nazism, communism, which justify violence by a kind of uh, pernicious means end uh, analysis. Namely, if the ends are infinitely good, if you can imagine a world that's going to be infinitely good forever, well, you can kind of commit as much violence as you want to bring it into being because the uh, ends always justify the means. You're always creating more good than uh, harm. Um, as the old saying went, you can't make an omelet without breaking eggs, neglecting the fact that human beings are not eggs. Well, that all sounds pretty depressing if we've got all of these reasons to uh, uh, hurt and kill and rape each other. What do we have on the other side uh, pushing back? What are the better angels of our nature? Well, there's self-control. They're circuitry <laughs> in the prefrontal cortex that can anticipate the consequences of behavior and inhibit our violent impulses. There's empathy, the ability to feel others' pain. There's the moral sense, a set of norms and taboos, which can actually go both ways. It can, the moral sense can actually license uh, moralistic violence. On the other hand, suitably deployed, it can also inhibit violence. And then there's reason, the cognitive processes that allow us to engage in objective, detached analysis. Uh, so the final question is, um, which historical developments bring out our better angels? Uh, how do we bring the history and the psychology back together again and, and pinpoint what has changed that uh, allows our better angels to stay in our hands before they can commit acts of bloodshed? One possibility is that Hobbes got it right when he called for a Leviathan, a, a state with a monopoly on the legitimate use of Force, which can neutralize the incentive for exploiting an attack by punishing aggression and therefore canceling out the anticipated gain. That will tend to calm everyone down because uh, if you have outsourced your revenge to a third party, you are no longer tempted to engage in preemptive attacks to wipe them out before they wipe you out. You don't have to uh, adopt a belligerent uh, macho stance to uh, establish the credibility of your deterrent threat, and you don't have to carry out pointless vengeance after the fact. Also, by uh, outsourcing violence, revenge to a third party, a uh, disinterested party, you circumvent the self-serving biases that uh, result in cycles of vendetta, because psychologists have shown that in any human dispute, both sides always believe that the other guy's attacks are naked aggression out of the blue, their own attacks are justified retaliation after the fact. Well, if you've got two sides, both uh, in the sway of these self-serving uh, moralistic delusions, you can get endless blood feeds and cycle of violence, which, cycles of violence which can be nipped in the bud when it's some other guy who is meeting out the justice. <laughs>
The second possibility is the theory of gentle commerce, according to which plunder is a zero-sum game, but trade is a positive-sum game, one in which, as we say, everybody wins. And that as improving technology allows goods and ideas to be traded over longer distances among larger groups of people and at lower cost, it becomes cheaper to buy things than to steal them, and other people become more valuable to you alive than dead. A third mechanism has been called the expanding circle. It's a term that was coined by Peter Singer, but the idea goes back to Charles Darwin. Namely, humans are equipped by evolution with a sense of empathy. That's the good news. The bad news is that by default, our circle of empathy only embraces uh, our blood relatives, our allies, and cute little fuzzy baby animals. But um, over the course of history, you can see the circle of empathy expanding to embrace the village, the clan, the tribe, the nation, other races, both sexes, children, and perhaps someday other species. This just raises the question of what expanded the circle, and it's possible that the technologies of enhanced cosmopolitanism are the answer. Namely, as it becomes cheaper to travel, to consume history, to uh, enjoy literature and drama and journalism, uh, it, uh, you know more about what other people are like, and you're less likely to uh, dehumanize them. And there is some experimental evidence that when people are encouraged to adopt the vantage point of a real person, or even a fictitious person, they become more sympathetic to that individual, but also to the category of people that that individual represents. Then there's the escalator of reason. The possibility that the growth of literacy, education, and public discourse has encouraged people to think more abstractly and more universally. They rise above their parochial vantage point. That makes it harder to privilege your own interests over others just because you're you and they're not. Uh, people stand back and recognize the futility of cycles of violence and increasingly see violence as a problem to be solved rather than as a contest to be won. Uh, the final question I'll address is, if there are four different forces that are all pushing in the same direction, it seems kind of seems like a massive coincidence. Uh, why are they pushing in the same direction? Now, I don't believe in any mystical force, any arc of justice, any grand historical dialectic. Uh, but rather, uh, a more prosaic but nonetheless profound answer is that violence is what game theorists call a social dilemma. Namely, it's always tempting to an aggressor to exploit a victim, but the harm done to the victim is always greater than the gain uh, enjoyed by the aggressor. Which means that in the long run, everyone would objectively be better off if we could all agree to endure violence. The dilemma is, how do you get the other guy to refrain from violence at the same time as you do? Because if you beat your swords into plowshares, but the neighbors keep theirs as swords, well, you could find yourself at the wrong end of, the, of an invading army. I think it's not impossible to think that over the course of history, human experience and human ingenuity have gradually uh, chipped away at this problem, just like we have reduced other scourges of the human condition, like pestilence and hunger. And if you ask me, what's the common denominator of the four trends against violence? It's that all of them increase the material, emotional, or cognitive incentives of all parties to avoid violence simultaneously. Well, whatever the best explanation of the decline of violence turns out to be, I think its implications are profound. For one thing, it calls for a reorientation of our efforts towards violence reduction from a moralistic mindset to an empirical mindset. That is, instead of lamenting why is there war, perhaps we should ask why is there peace? Not just what are we doing wrong, but what have we been doing right? Because we have been doing something right, and uh, it strikes me as a rather important problem to try to figure out what exactly it is. Also, the decline of violence calls for a reassessment of modernity, of the centuries-long process that has eroded family, tribe, tradition, and religion, uh, and given way to the concepts of individual rights, human cosmopolitanism, reason, and science. Now, everyone acknowledges that modernity has brought us many gifts, longer and healthier lives, less ignorance and superstition, 
richer experiences. There's always been a current of nostalgia and romanticism that has questioned the price. Is it worth it, they say, if we have to live under the shadow of terrorism, genocide, world wars, and nuclear weapons? But if, as I have shown, despite impressions, the long-term trend, though halting and incomplete, is that violence of all kinds is decreasing, I believe that calls for a rehabilitation of the ideals of modernity and progress, and it's cause for gratitude for the institutions of civilization and enlightenment that have made it happen. And uh, with that, I thank all of you. I thank uh, Richard Dawkins. I thank the East Alliance of America for uh, bringing me here to share these ideas with you this evening. Thank you.